Good morning, it's Friday the 23rd of August and this is Govind Raj Ethi Raj headquartered and broadcasting and streaming from Mumbai, India's financial capital usually and presently in transit. The take, will the Adanis do what the regulators perhaps fail to? How can we invest in a stock where we feel the promoter himself is actively involved in? Now, whether these were the actual words or not told to the founding family of Reliance Industries maybe about 25 years ago, this was a reference I heard from an investment banker who was close to the family and helped in some of their fund issuances. Fast forward, the Adani Group is essentially faced with a similar perception issue. Like Reliance then, the Adani Group seems to be near Teflon coated on issues relating to regulators in general and specific like the Securities and Exchange Board of India, whose investigation into the ownership of companies sitting outside but allegedly acting in concert with the promoters in India and investing in their stocks seems to have gone nowhere. Remember, Adani Group stocks like Adani Enterprises, Power and Energy Solutions have close to a declared promoter holding of almost 75%, which means that floating stock is low and thus the likelihood of prices shooting up is high, all other factors constant. A few weeks ago, Hindenburg Research, the New York-based short seller, released a fresh set of posers targeting this time the SEBI chairperson Madhubi Puri Butch and questioned her impartiality given that there were some distinct links between her own past and private career investments and some Adani funds. Now, there was clearly a case and still is for her to disclose publicly the areas of conflict in past decision-making as she said she had done but to the board of the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Now, this has not happened as yet which would suggest by inference that her saying or revealing anything publicly would also throw a fresh shadow on Adani's dealings with, again, law enforcement in general and SEBI in particular. But all this evident clout, even if for good reason, is not helping the Adani's image and actually only makes it worse. With each subsequent shot Hindenburg has fired, Adani's reputation in the eyes of institutional and other investors has undoubtedly slipped further. One example is the low institutional and mutual fund investor holding for a while and things have really not improved much, except for maybe one or two cases. Fund managers I've spoken to have tried to avoid getting into much detail but acknowledged their low exposure. But it's not just fund managers. As I've seen, investors question the system as a whole when they see it not working transparently. Particularly if they are exploring getting into or investing further into businesses where Indian conglomerates like Adani already have a presence. Hindenburg Research, just to recap, had specifically criticized the Adani family for using a complicated web of offshore entities to control a larger stake in their listed businesses than disclosed to exchanges. So like before, there is a question of how free and fair the Indian capital market ecosystem is and how transparent. Now, there is a tendency to believe that if something works 90 or 95% of the time freely and fairly, then we should not really bother too much about the other 5 to 10%. That logic, which is quite clearly in operation here, has actually not worked in the past in my understanding and clearly not working for the Adanis either. Since, with every Hindenburg hit, which is an active attack, and the passive one, which is many investors staying away, the image of the company's stock has suffered and continues to, and by extension, the countries as well. Adani's perhaps recognized this after their initial and somewhat nationalistic pushback in January 2023, when Hindenburg put out its first report and realized that this did not work. Now, there seems to be a fresh attempt to clean up. Bloomberg is now reporting that Gautam Adani plans to appoint auditors from a top global firm and hire a CEO for his family offices to bring a level of disclosure often associated with listed companies. So the founders of the Adani Group are apparently talking to two of the big six accounting firms to audit their family office accounts, which obviously would mean that, or rather it would reflect all their wealth and where it is going or where it is residing at this point. The move says Bloomberg could, or rather hopes to bring transparency into how the wealth of the Adanis, which is valued at about $105 billion, is managed. Now, the details do not matter too much here, but Reliance, as I've mentioned in earlier core reports as well, did something more or rather specific two decades ago by bringing in external auditors and the Bank of New York to manage their share transfers or depository. Now, all the names at that point were reputable and obviously helped in the medium to long term. Adani is trying something similar from what I can see. As things stand, if this move pans out, Adani's image would benefit, as will the overall stock market. I do feel the Adani's still need to address the issue of offshore investors head-on, talk about what was going on and come clean to the extent that they can. Maybe the new structure and auditors is the pathway to do that. Either way, this will be the best way to put the matter behind and move on. No one thinks the Adani's have built a financial illusion in their companies and recognize the hard assets that power their organizations from ports to airports to cement and power, including green power. But addressing the financial mystery in ownership and stock behavior is critical for the long term and good for everyone.
You can accuse the Ambani's of many things today, including hosting over-the-top weddings, but no one would say that the ownership of their companies is fuzzy or their stock price is under a cloud. And that brings us to the top stories and themes for the day. The stock markets rise for the sixth session, all by slowly. How Indian automakers' multi-fuel approach for the same car model is paying off. A much-delayed census might finally be coming even as the clamor for good economic and social data increases. Gold is holding near record highs globally, decoding the India outlook. Deposits and banks are not growing as fast as lending is, a recap on why this is important. And finally, after all the government's good efforts, remittances, that is outward, are declining. This is a core report with Govindraj Atiraj. The markets gain for six sessions now. A Federal Reserve cut is the big signal that stock markets are once again focused on world over. While the markets did not shoot up in India and stayed range-bound, they continue to advance, although slowly. Both benchmarks have logged gains for six sessions in a row, adding about 3% each, according to Reuters. The BSE benchmark index ended at 81,053 on Thursday, up 148 points, while the NEC Nifty 50 closed with gains of 41 points at 24,812. The broad markets were stronger, with the mid- and small-cap indices doing well. The small-cap seems to have hit a record high, and the mid-cap and the small-cap added 0.67% and 0.5% respectively. Meanwhile, oil prices are continuing to fall. Oil prices have extended their decline to the lowest in more than six months as trend following algorithmic sellers overlooked a bullish U.S. stockpile report, according to Bloomberg. Brent crude is now quoting at $76.45, or less than $77 per barrel. Now, this is in general good news for India because Russian crude that was available cheaply for almost two years is now almost at the same price as crude elsewhere. All of this increases India's import bill and has done so, and which is also visible from the macro figures. So a lower oil price is obviously good for all of us. Tata's punch gains on multi-fuels. Speaking of oil and crude in general, Tata Motors Punch has become India's top-selling car, surpassing Maruti Suzuki's Wagon R with over 126,000 units sold between Jan and July 2024, according to a report from the Economic Times. The success of Punch marks the end of Maruti Suzuki's long-standing dominance in this segment. Now, this lead apparently did not hold in July, that's the last month, but the longer six-month period reflects the clear shift that I'm coming to. So the interesting thing is that Punch is a multi-fuel car model, and that is also obviously an interesting reflection of consumer behavior. Alternate fuels, including CNG or compressed natural gas and electric, represent nearly half of Punch's total sales, says that ET report. Maruti Suzuki's Wagon R is 45%, Ertiga, another Maruti brand, is 58%. Remember, we also saw a multi fuel bike launch from Bajaj Auto. Now, those who track the auto industry obviously know this and have been seeing this for a while, but it's interesting how Indian consumers have switched to cleaner fuels because of affordability and, of course, availability and In many cases, the fact that they get much better mileage. While electric could be cleaner, hybrid cars are doing better than electric in India, which suggests that for various reasons, people want cheaper and durable fuels first. Hyundai has seen similar benefits amongst its models and gained when they launched a multi-fuel model. So the other interesting thing is that in earlier days, the same model may have different features depending on whether it was a premium or basic version. Today, A model is evidently further subdivided into which fuel it runs on and thus otherwise has the same features or offers the same features. A census is coming. For the last two years, at least, economists among others have been clamoring for the Indian government to conduct the once-in-ten-year census which was last held in 2011 and should have therefore been held in 2021. So COVID came and went, as did many major elections, including the latest one in 2024. So it was not clear whether there were any challenges faced in the kind of mobilization required to conduct a census for which a full-fledged government body exists, in any case, who in turn works with government officials across the country, very similar to the Election Commission, who of course has been quite active. Reuters is now reporting that India may start conducting a long-delayed population census in September. It will take about 18 months to complete the new survey after it begins next month. The lack of data and current data obviously leads to speculation of why it's not being done at best and poor policy planning and response at worst, including responses to 
issues like inflation, jobs, and other fairly burning ones. Most government schemes, by the way, run on the findings of the last population census released in that 2011 year, give or take. Gold prices, where are they headed? So gold is in record territory, topping about $2,500 an ounce on expectations that the Federal Reserve could cut interest rates in September. Gold has already jumped about 21% year to date, making it one of the best performing major commodities in 2024. And many analysts are saying that this could go further up, maybe to about $2,700 by next year. Now, we've been discussing gold prices here for a while in the context of both retail as well as central banks, including India, buying more gold. And to get a sense on how gold prices were looking in India right now and the outlook, including into the festive season, I reached out to Sugandha Sachdeva, Commodity and Currency Analyst and founder of Delhi-based SS Wealth Street. And I began by asking her how she was seeing the global and the local outlook. So if you see gold prices, they have been one of the major performing assets this year, having gained more than 20% so far this year. It's majorly the safe haven demand, which has ignited strong returns and demand for gold this year. It's the tensions that we have seen in the Middle East and the Russia-Ukraine war is also going on. And besides this, central banks have been loading up gold into their reserves. And besides this, the expectations of rate cut by the US Fed this year it's going to be the start of monetary easing cycle by the US Fed. So that's a key catalyst which is driving gold prices. Apart from that, the Indian rupee depreciation, that has also acted as a major tailwind for gold prices. Even though on the domestic scenario, we are not seeing gold prices at record highs right now, but in the international market, prices are very close to the record highs of in spot gold. We have seen highs of around $25, 30 per ounce mark. So as of now, the Fed recent minutes have kind of confirmed the fact there were a lot of bets that Fed is going to start its monetary easing cycle in September. And Fed minutes have shown that policymakers are quite inclined towards that. And there is going to be 25 basis rate cut in September. There's high probability as of now. And so rate cuts are on the horizon. And we also anticipate that Fed is going to cut rate at its three further meetings this year in 2024. So in all, we are anticipating a rate cut of around 75 basis point to 100 basis point this year. So this is, in a way, a very positive trigger for gold prices because gold doesn't pay any interest. So whenever the interest rates are lowered, it kind of reduces the opportunity cost of holding gold. Besides this, a rate cut is also a signal that growth is kind of receding in U.S. There are growth concerns. Apart from that, the U.S. payrolls data has also been revised lower recently as per the recent data. So for the year ending March 2024, so the jobs have been revised lower by 820k. So this is signaling a softness in the labor market in US. So these are all very positive triggers for gold prices. And that's the reason we have seen gold prices staying quite buoyant. Apart from that, central banks have been loading on to gold. And we are also seeing physical demand also coming back in India after the recent import duty cut by the government. So in all, we anticipate that in the last quarter of this year, because of the festival demand and also because of the import duty cut because of which we have seen a sharp cut in prices also. The demand is going to increase significantly. So all of these factors are kind of driving gold prices as of now. Right. So if I were to come to India specifically, how are you seeing the demand and supply forces and what's really either pushing it up or down at this point? So the forces of demand are basically strong central bank buying, geopolitical tensions, as I mentioned, and the prospects of rate cut by the US Fed. However, on the negative side, we also see certain factors which are playing out at the moment. China has not been loading on to gold right now. In fact, Chinese demand has declined almost 24% in July. And in June also, the demand fell by around 58%. Chinese central bank was one of the major factors which was driving prices last year and this year also. But then for the last couple of months, China has not been amassing gold significantly. Besides this, the geopolitical tensions in the Middle East are also kind of easing. So that could also play out and can kind of, can be a slight dampener for prices. Apart from this, markets would be looking forward to further policy signals from the Jackson Hole Symposium this week, where Fed is, Chair is about to give further insights into the rate cut path and may also talk about the quantum of rate cuts this year. So that will also have an impact on gold prices. So we do see that Overall trend in gold is very positive, but then in the domestic markets, if I talk about specifically, I see a strong hurdle in place 
at 72,300 odd levels. In case that hurdle is convincingly reached, we see further rally in gold prices. However, in case that is not reached, there can be some dip in prices and we see prices finding floor at levels of 70,500 odd levels. In the international markets also, I foresee that prices will consolidate for a while between 2450 to 2520, where 2520 mark is acting as a strong resistance area as of now. Only if that is breached, further momentum is likely in near term. Otherwise, some consolidation is quite likely in prices. Right. So if you were to look at uh, gold prices in India before customs duties were reduced in the budget in July and today, how would you describe, let's say, the elasticity or the nature of demand? I mean, or the propensity to buy or consume more? I think at higher prices, Indian demand had also reduced. If we look at the recent data, in the April to June quarter, demand fell by around 5% in India. However, as per the latest reports by World Gold Council, this drop in prices is likely to entice a lot of buying interest. And in the last quarter of this year, 50 tons additional demand is likely to come in. But rather, we anticipate slightly more demand as we have spoken to certain dwellers also and people who are selling gold physical bars as well. So demand is likely to pick up significantly. So I think demand by the end of this year is likely to pick up. And we see demand at healthy 850 to 900 tons. So this was the steepest cut in import duty on record and the lowest since June 2013. So I think this is certainly likely to entice a lot of buying in trusted gold. Right. That's a good note to end on. So, Ganda, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. Why are banks struggling for deposits? The Finance Minister of India said last week that banks should do more to raise deposits, including offering innovative products and perhaps higher interest rates as well, since they had the leeway. The looming problem, if it can be called that, is that the gap between lending and deposits has shrunk and now to levels both the Finance Minister and the Reserve Bank of India Governor have repeatedly called uncomfortable. The Finance Minister pointed out that deposit growth has been lagging credit growth in India by 3-4% to in recent months. So one reason for all of this is that people are putting money into mutual funds, real estate or stock markets instead of putting them into fixed deposits and there could be other reasons as well. So I reached out to economist Dr. Brinda Jagirdar and I asked her to recap what was happening and why this was important in the larger macroeconomic context of borrowing and lending. One of the reasons for slower deposit growth, deposit growth lagging credit growth, of course, is that the overall household savings, which is about 60% of the total savings in the country, this has come down. Now, the share of overall household savings as a percentage of GDP is about 18.4% according to the NSSO data in 2023. This against 22.7% in FY21 and an overall 10-year average of 20%. So you see the overall savings, household savings in the economy is shrinking. That is one. And if you look at the RBI data, RBI in its uh, financial stability report said that the share of financial savings and total household savings has come down from about 40% in the 10-year period from 2013 to 22 to about 29% now. So you see the household savings are shrinking and within that the financial savings are shrinking. So this is getting reflected in the trend of deposit and advances growth in the economy. Deposit growth, if you take this whole financial year, has been lagging. The rate of growth of deposits has been lower than the rate of growth of advances for all scheduled commercial banks. Taking the latest data, 26 July 24, credit growth at 15%, at deposit growth at about 11%. This is excluding the HDFC impact merger, merger of the HDFC bank. Even if you exclude this uh, merger impact, it's 14% for credit growth and 11% for deposits. So over the year, the whole year, Deposit growth has lagged credit growth by about 3 to 4 percentage points everywhere, even up to 5 percentage points at some time. So this growth in deposit, which is not picking up, which is not keeping in step with credit growth, is, is definitely a cause for concern. And this is mainly, and further now, even if you look at the household saving pattern, not only has the share in share of household saving in financial assets gone down, but its share in physical assets has actually gone up. And net financial savings has gone down. So that is why I think the governor and the finance minister have raised this issue. Right. So a couple of questions, including a hypothetical. So right now it appears that banks are borrowing institutionally through certificates of deposits. And that number seems to have gone up quite dramatically 
this year as opposed to last year for this period uh, it was about 1.89 lakh crores or 189000 crores and now it's about 3.5 lakh crores so my hypothetical question here is why would the banks or why are the banks compelled to borrow from somewhere else to lend i mean couldn't they just slow down lending for example the economy is really growing very fast so a lot of measures have been taken to make sure that the manufacturing sector picks up that the services sector grows and you can see all that in that growth numbers gdp growth numbers so to keep up this credit demand banks are looking at uh, looking at credit from i mean a deposit if a revenue from wherever they can funds from wherever they can source now why is this deposit growth lagging credit growth why is credit growth it's at such a high rate mainly because the personal credit that retail credit that is showing a very high high growth and uh, banks are also pushing retail credit in fact the governor has been cautioning banks to go slow on uh, retail credit and also we have a young labor force with a greater appetite for borrowing and uh, maybe for lifestyle reasons or whatever and also because technology has made it so much easier to borrow so therefore banks the, the young labor force the young working population is you know willing to take on more risk and within the financial instruments if you see there's a shift away from bank fixed fixed deposits and consumers are willing to invest into equities mutual funds small savings and this is helped by the upi and digital growth because then they don't have to keep so much money in the fixed deposits they need to keep money in savings so that they can move it around more easily aided by upi and the digital growth obviously what's working in one end of the financial spectrum is creating problems at the other end governor and the finance minister have both been saying that banks should get more either aggressive or innovative with their products and offerings to draw in more depositors what could that mean as in wouldn't a higher interest rate be the only attraction or could there be other things as well household sector or other investors not only are more interested in other financial instruments they're also interested in the real estate so there's more demand for real estate from the household sector and there's increased demand for foreign travel high end spending increase in personal loans so when this trend is on it's very difficult to say that it's not an easy situation to garner deposits from such a such a depositor base so yes i suppose the banks will have to look for innovative methods because increasing the cost of deposits will also mean increasing the cost of credit and at a time when the economy is investing at a time when the government pushing for more and more investment in manufacturing and capex and increasing more investment in the economy it would not be such a good idea to increase the cost of credit because that could in turn slow down all the steps that have been taken right and have you seen similar cycles or rather i'm sure you've seen similar cycles before including while being an economist at the state bank of india how do these things usually resolve themselves if they do the past is not always a good guide to the future especially now when the environment has completely changed so so here <laughs> here govin i'll have to say that we'll have to learn lessons from what we are seeing now over here and uh, you know, earlier what happened was that domestic savings in india was such a robust source of lending for banks so they would come into bank deposits and they would be passed on into the credit stream but now if the deposits are going to slow down then if it would mean that our dependence on external sources would go up to that extent you know fdi we were not very dependent on fdi for our growth it was always domestic savings which fueled domestic growth so that is a trend we need to watch out for and make sure it doesn't get reversed brinda thank you so much for joining me thank you govin remittances is finally dropped So the mandarins of policy making in India must be breathing collective sighs of relief because outward remittances a constant source of blood pressure to policy makers maybe for about 50 years if not longer has slowed down. Business Standard reports that outward remittances under the Reserve Bank of India's liberalized remittance scheme or LRS has dropped almost 24% year on year to 6.9 billion dollars in the April to June quarter of this year compared to about 9 billion last year. In June specifically remittances fell about 44% to about 2.1 billion dollars thanks to a decline in remittances across categories. So why is this happening? So one reason obviously is that the union government introduced a tax collected at source a presumptive tax on remittances under the scheme for all purposes except education and medical treatment from 1st of July 2023 which was later deferred to 
1st of October 2023. So this tax collected at source is a presumptive tax and as I can see not applicable anywhere else in the world. The LRA scheme was introduced in 2004 and it permitted resident individuals to send up to $250,000 per financial year for any permissible current or capital account transaction free of cost. So returning to remittances and the fact that they're declining, in the first quarter of the current financial year, the largest segment, that's international travel, recorded a 6% drop to about $3.8 billion. Similarly, remittances for maintenance of closed relatives also dropped 46% to now less than a billion dollars. Similarly, with gifts, which have dropped 41%, and investments in equity and debt have also dropped compared to last year. So there could, of course, be many reasons for all of this. But like I said, presumably there is more peace and calm now that many of these moves, which are fairly draconian, considering that we were more liberal earlier, are working. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopses or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening.